Welcome to the public lecture um, organized by Department of Chemistry of CTU. So for the people who are not in Hong Kong, welcome to this virtual space of Hong Kong. So um, today is a great day. Um, we have um, um, a lecture by um, one of our professors um, in the department, um, live stream so, from um, France. So, um, we have also here um, Professor Alex Zhang, um, the po folks of our university, and he will like he will now um, introduce our speaker today, Professor Le Professor uh, Zhang. Okay, thank you, Yunhua. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Professor Zhang Marilyn, colleagues, fellow teachers, and students, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the City University of Hong Kong, uh, <clears throat> it's uh, uh, my great pleasure to uh, warmly welcome you to this uh, live lecture by Professor John Mary Lin, co-organized by Office of Provost, uh, College of Science and the Department of Chemistry. Today, we are very delighted uh, to have more than uh, 200 uh, participants, uh, particularly uh, 150 uh, secondary school students and teachers uh, join from their home, schools, offices, and anywhere. There are also some friends watching on YouTube where we do the live streaming. Thank you all for uh, supporting this event and hope that you will enjoy it this afternoon. This is such an extraordinary time the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has confined half of the world uh, population to self-isolation, confronting the worst economical uh, prospect since the Second World War. Many people are losing hope and becoming uh, cynical and also uh, cynical of the bleak and also uncertain future. <clears throat> Chemist minds are not uh, exactly the same. We know that. The universe is built from only 118 chemical elements. The combination of this element can give us the deadliest virus, okay, but can also give us the most miraculous uh, cure to instill hope to our friends, uh, to our friends, and to celebrate the importance of a chemical science in this uh, uh, precarious uh, time. We are most honored to have invited Professor Sean Mary Lynn, our distinguished visiting professor and the Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, 1987, to give us a special gift, a live lecture from France. Professor Lynn is currently professor of the Institute of Advanced Study of the University of Strasbourg, senior fellow of the CDU Institute for Advanced Study and the visiting distinguished professor of our Department of Chemistry. Prior to his tenure at Strasbourg, uh, Professor Land has been faculty member at the uh, University uh, Louis Pasteur, uh, then the College of France uh, over the past three decades. Uh, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1987 for his study on the chemical basis of a molecular recognition which also plays a fundamental role in biological processes. Uh, he furthered his effort in launching the now flourishing, uh, flourishing uh, field of a supramolecular chemistry. Uh, today, the topic of uh, uh, Professor Lane's uh, lecture is Steps Toward Life Chemistry. He will share his uh, philosophical view in chemistry uh, looking at how the evolution of the universe has generated more complex form of matter through self-organization uh, self from particles up to living and a thinking organism. And in particular, what chemistry has been taking part during the process. I trust his sharing will definitely uh, bring lots of insights. So without further ado, Please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Lan. Professor Lan, now the, yep. the platform is for uh, is yours. Thank you very much. You hear me clearly? Yes. Good. So it's a pleasure to be 
virtually in Hong Kong. Unfortunately, I would prefer to be there really and not virtually. But these are the times where we connect virtually. I would like to thank the Department of Chemistry for organizing this lecture. And I think the slight delay in the lecture, this is just nothing, no reason to be worried about. Half an hour is nothing if we look at a lifetime, if we look at the age of the universe. So let's forget that. I'm happy to be back here virtually, as I said, at City University, where I am a member of the chemistry department, at the visiting professor, and also at the Institute for Advanced Study. It's always a pleasure to be in touch. Let's say you mentioned, Professor Jen mentioned, that they are very unusual times, which is true. It is true, they are very unusual, but not just because there is a virus running around, also because our conditions, the way we have developed, the very advanced state of our societies has made it also sensitive to perturbations. These perturbations are probably very minor. Of course, for the moment, we feel them very strongly, but this is just passing. And if you look back into the past, when there were the epidemies of plague, many, many more people got killed. And it took for years and years and years and was coming back every 10 years. So let's calm down and consider that we are living a perturbed time, but this time we recede. And as one says, after the storm, the sun shines. We are in the hands of science and all this big talk we have for all over the world coming about solutions and this and that. The solution is in the hands of science. We need a drug, we need a vaccine, and then things will be normal again. So let's just wait until we have that. It may take some time. And of course, we are all impatient. We all want to go very quickly. We all want to have our way of life. But all right, sometimes that is not so easy. And uh, we have just to wait it, wait it out until the solution is found. On the scale of centuries, this is just a very small perturbation. Of course, it touches many people, and for them, it's not necessarily a small perturbation, but it's a local perturbation. So I will come back to these things, and maybe there will be questions about also these general questions, this general problem. Let me come then to my talk. I sort of consider it as a sort of a chemical journey, starting very early and coming now to the state in which we are. So the title is Steps Towards Life. And the answer to these steps, these steps, they'll deal with chemistry. And I will try to show you. Of course, you will see also that it's not just chemistry, but chemistry plays a very important role there. In order to put everything into perspective, let's start a very long time ago, 14 billion years. At that time, there was a Big Bang. And out of this Big Bang, our universe was born. At the beginning, as you can see here, this red spot I show you, the universe expanded very quickly. At that time, it was very, very hot. It cooled down rather rapidly, but it was still very hot after three minutes. After 300,000 years, it was about 6,000 degrees. At that time, at these early times, there was no chemistry. It was much too hot for that. This was what you may call the age of physics. No chemistry. But the universe cooled down and it became cool enough to have particles form and particles associated together to give atoms. And then atoms could combine to make constructions, which we call molecules. At that time, about here, chemistry started in our universe. The bricks of matter were formed, which we call elements. I will come back to that. 
and chemistry started. These objects which formed became bigger by random combinations. They began to associate. They created at some stage sort of separations, membranes and so on. And out of that, something new, very new appeared, a property which we call life. Around here, on our planet Earth, life started there. This is the age of biology. But at least on our planet, and I'm quite convinced on others too, evolution continued. The biological organisms became more and more complicated and evolved. They developed other features, other properties, and the most important one by far is thought, thinking. These are the steps towards life and thought. It is because of thinking that we are here together, that we talk to each other, that we are able to be together today. Thought is represented here by this sculpture, by a French sculptor called Auguste Rodin. As you see, it's a person sitting on a rock and thinking hard. It's called the thinker, this sculpture by Rodin. Let me also already now insist on one thing. As you see on the right, that's the end of the screen. But it is not the end of the universe evolution. Our universe will continue to evolve. Nothing can stop it. And if we hear people now on the planet Earth, our point in space and in time, we have to be modest. We are just a point in space and in time. This will continue to evolve. Nobody can stop it. And if we don't take advantage of what we can do ourselves, we will be just the slaves of this evolution. But we have to take it in our own hands. I will come back to that later. So the question then is, how does it, this, this universe evolve? This looks like a black screen with nothing on it. Indeed, there is nothing on it. But what I want to show is this. Our universe is made up, as our cosmologists tell us today, of about 95% of darkness, 68% of dark energy, 27% of dark matter, which means 95%, which is dark and we don't know much about. However, there's 5% visible matter. And this visible matter, this is what we are part of, our visible matter. And that is the matter that matters, as I like to say. This is the matter which is important for us because we, as human beings, on a small ball in the universe, the planet Earth, are part of that visible matter, like the Earth, like the, like the moon, like the sun, and so on. And this makes up just 5% but it is the important matter, the matter that matters. Now, the evolution of this matter has been an increase in complexity, and let's say information, complexity and information as a function of time. Initially, the matter was divided, split into particles. Then it became condensed making assemblies of particles, and then became organized, making entities, matter, material entities, which had a certain organization. At some stage, it became living by a process we don't understand yet. We don't know the details, but we will know more and more about it. And in the future, we'll understand in detail what has happened and how it happened. Then it began thinking, which is a big, big step, between living and thinking matter, I consider that the step is much more important than between organized and living. Because without thinking, we would not be here. Life would have been no interest if you don't think. Beyond that, there may be something else. We don't know what it is, but we cannot exclude that there is something more complex, more informed than what we know as thinking for, is for us. So that is the evolution of matter. 
under a sort of a force which is like a pressure of complexity and information towards complex forms of matter. At this point, we now has to have to ask a big question. What is the big, big question we have to ask? This question is, how does matter become complex? What are the pathways by which we can go from the elementary particle to a thinking organism? And maybe there are even higher forms of complex matter, which could be evolved or created. We don't know that. Maybe. So what is the answer to that question? In order to try to get an answer, to find an answer to this complexification, this, ar this arising of more and more complex forms of matter, mankind on our planet, in this very, very small spot in the universe, in small spot in time, small spot in space, mankind created something we call science. And I am going to consider just three areas of science, which in some ways form the basis. Physics deals with the laws of the universe, the way our universe functions, the way things develop, the way things in our universe interact, why, how, it has, uh, how it has formed, how it develops, and so on. These are the laws on which the overall universe depends. Biology is another part of our science on our planet. Biology deals with the rules of life. These are rules, they're not laws, because the laws are the basic laws which are those of our universe. But these are the rules of life. How does it work? Now, what is chemistry doing? Chemistry is trying to build this bridge, this bridge between these general laws of physics and the rules of complex matter, that means life, thinking, and so on. It builds the bridge towards complex matter. How is it possible, is the question, how is it possible to go from general laws, the laws of our universe, to specific expressions of these laws, which have generated, which have given rise to an organism like mankind, like human beings on our planet. Now, one may give an answer to that question by one word. Now, this seems to be very strange. How can one just give an answer in such a complex, in just something we don't know yet? It's just that there is a process which I consider is the answer to that, which is self-organization. That doesn't mean anything and means everything. It's a word. We understand the word. It means that it has happened by itself, by its internal structure, has led to this development. And self-organization is the basis of the arising of complex matter on, in the universe. The self-organization is a process which we have to try to understand, which is the basis of generating living and thinking organisms. Now, one can even say that it is a cosmic imperative in our universe. Our universe has such a structure that it will self-organize. It will lead to complex matter somewhere around in the universe. The self-organization, can we say a little bit more about it? We can talk about self-organization on the cosmic, on the universe scale, on the large scale of the universe, which occurs through gravitational forces. Cosmologists tell us that the structuration of the universe is the result of these gravitational forces acting on the initial homogeneity in density of matter after the Big Bang and the rates of expansion at very early times. This led then to the generation of the objects present in our universe. But that is not what we are concerned about, so to say. 
why we are interested in this complex visible matter, this visible matter, this 5% complex matter, which is the molecular matter, we come back to that later, and this has formed, been generated through electromagnetic forces acting on the pieces, the build up, the building blocks of visible matter, of matter. And these have led to sort of structuration by random combinations, random meaning that there was no design in it. It was just the laws of our universe which lead to the formation of these molecular matter entities, these combinations of structures of elements of the universe. Now, wait, let's go back just to think about this evolution. You know all that living organisms on our planet evolved through what is called the Darwinian evolution. But before there was any life, there could not be a Darwinian evolution. Therefore, there was a prebiotic, purely chemical evolution, which was a self-organization of non-living matter preceding the self-organization and the evolution of living matter. And this is a much broader evolution than Darwinian and even Darwinian evolution may be considered as a chemical evolution because the basis of it, as you will see later, is residing in the genome of living organisms. So chemistry is usually considered as the science of the structure of matter, how it is built, and the transformation of matter, how matter can be transformed, how the entities of matter can be transformed into one another. This again, we will consider more clearly in a moment. Now, people have a long time ago started to ask themselves questions. Mankind tried to see what is this, what are we made of? What is around us? What does it mean? And there were 2,500 years ago in a small country called Greece in Europe, there were people who were thinking about, and probably in other regions of the world, there must also have been. And one of them, one of those so-called philosophers, Empedocles, proposed that matter was made of elements, earth, fire, air, and water, four of them, which by combination give properties. Fire and air was hot, air and water was humid, cold for earth, water, and earth and fire was dry. This was an attempt, it was already a proposal. It was simple and we could consider it trivial, but okay, it's a start. It happened, however, that at the same time, there was another person who had a much, much deeper insight into that. Without going to the details of the history of science, nevertheless, there is somebody called Democritus, who at that time had a much deeper insight he considered that matter is particulate. It is made of very small particles, particles which can not be divided anymore. And in Greek language, a tomos means you cannot cleave, you cannot cleave it anymore. A tomos is atoms. So this term of atoms was introduced as a tomos in the Greek language and Democritus was the person, one of them at that time, there were many developments, who pro proposed that. Now, it is said that not only I mean, this looks like a theory, a proposal, a philosophical proposal, which it may well be, but we can also say that, and people think that Democritus had a deeper insight. And let me just show you how you could convince anybody in the street, that matter must be particulate. Take a glass of water, take a piece of sugar, put the piece of sugar in the glass of water. The piece of sugar dissolves. The piece of sugar disappears in the glass of water. If matter had been continuous, this would not be possible. 
the piece of sugar could not enter intimately, intimately into the water. Therefore, matter must be made of particles which can mix together, and this is the seemingly the origin. And people say that this kind of thought had was present in Democritus thinking. So now, of course, then science developed, and we will make a big jump because I have no time to talk about history of science. This would be take this would take weeks and weeks and weeks. Let's jump. Over the years, then scientists, chemists, physicists, and so on, they analyzed this matter around us, and they formed they they uh, then discovered that it was indeed made of things of things they called elements of pieces they called elements. And they give them names like iron, zinc, lead, and so on. And this seemed a bit complicated, a big bunch of these elements, like a zoo. And it took the 19th century, half middle 19th century, to have people make some sense out of it. The person who was most operational in that was a Russian chemist, Dmitry Mendeleev. He was he brought order into this sort of chaotic picture of all these elements which had been discovered in 1869. That means just almost a little bit more than 150 years ago. Last year it was the 150th anniversary of Mendeleev's paper, which is a landmark paper here shown here. I show you the original paper in the German journal Zeitschrift Hi. für Chemie. And in English, it's on the relationships between the properties and the atomic weight of the elements. Mendeleev had noted that if you consider the properties of the elements and their atomic weights, you could organize them in a table, which is shown here. This is the original table. Here you are looking at the very original table, which was proposed by Mendeleev in this paper of 1869, where you have Row, columns and rows here, as you can see, of elements. And for instance, you can see here uh, one, this is bor uh, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. This is, as you can see, this is one of these rows. You have sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium. That's another one, and so on and so on. So, this is a classification of the elements. That even Mendeleev even introduced question marks, because at that time he was convinced that here we did these were elements which had not yet been discovered and they must exist. This is being quite courageous to say this must exist. It's a lot of confidence in his organization, in way of looking at things. And of course, they were discovered. So this is what we now call the periodic table of the elements. And presently, it has this aspect. This is the present day periodic table of the elements which make up visible matter. These are the bricks of matter, of the matter, the visible matter in our universe. Now I would like I like to insist on that, and I always insist quite a long time on this, because this is one of the major, the most important advances in understanding the visible matter, in understanding the elements and the universe, in science in general. Why? Because this table shows us the bricks of matter, and there are no other bricks of visible matter in our universe. How can one be so strong in stating that? It's even, I guess, for a scientist, a sort, it's very dogmatic. It's, uh, you don't feel well, you don't feel so confident, but that is it. This is just because these bricks of matter are like counting one, two, three, four, five. There's nothing between one and two, nothing between two and three, nothing between three and four. And here, what we do, 
we just count. You know that atoms are made of a nucleus with protons, neutrons, and of electrons around them. So this is one electron. Helium is two electrons. Lithium is three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so on. You just count the number of particles making, making up the atoms. And all matter, all visible matter in our universe is made of these elements. So if there is any living organism, thinking organism anywhere else in our universe, that entity will be built from the same elements. It will be built from carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, maybe some other elements which we don't have so, to use so much. Maybe it's built of arsenic, maybe it's built of palladium, maybe it's built of yttrium. I don't know, but it is these elements. The natural elements, they go to, to uh, uranium here. These are artificial elements which are made in accelerators, in big smash, uh, atom smashing machines. But these are the natural ones here up to uranium. And we are made of that. These are our elements. These are the building blocks of visible matter. And this is the playground of chemistry. Chemists are like children. Children, you know, you certainly in Hong Kong have the same. This, play, this game, which is called Lego, where children can build large structures on the basis of small building blocks. And this is what chemists do. They are like children using the elements, combining them in infinite shapes, structures, and an infinite possible combinations. Now, this is a structure of matter. What is, or let's say, the composition of matter? But then you have to be able to transform matter, to transform objects in matter from one to another one. The basic law of that was proposed by Lavoisier. It is the basic law of transforming objects, chemical objects, if, into one another. He said, nothing is lost, not, rien ne se perd, rien ne se crée, nothing is created to se transform, everything is transformed, is transformable. And this is the basic law of chemical reactions. You have an amount, a certain number of elements in your anti chemical entities, your molecules. They react with one another. They give another a reorganization, other types of entities, which are reorganizations of the elements. And this is the basic law, without which, of course, you cannot do any chemistry. Now, uh, we have just now talked about the composition of matter. We have talked about transformation, the laws of transformation, the rule of transformation. But matter is not just a composition of elements. People noted then, also in the middle of the 19th century, that elements can be connected, and they are connected following given rules. There's not anything happening. There are rules for connecting the elements together. So they came up with graphs, graphical representations you can see here. I showed only three of many which had been proposed and which show ways of representing molecules, combinations of atoms. Würz in France proposed the top one. Kikule in Germany proposed the top bottom one. These are, well, they are not wrong, but they are sort of strange representations. Loschmidt in, the, in Austria proposed this in the middle, which is much closer in many respects, because he considered a big circle for being a carbon atom, a small circle for being a hydrogen atom. And this is then a representation of four molecules. Let me just look at the second one, ethyl alcohol, which you know, that's the, the alcohol, which is very much used by human beings too. And here it is. This ethyl alcohol is CH3, CH2OH. So the representation of Loschmidt is quite correct. But of course, complicated molecules cannot be represented graphically by circles. It's much too complicated. 
So this is now, we now use just symbols, just letters, C, H, O, N, and so on. So now we know that chemical entities are not only composition, they have a connectivity, they have a graphical structure. But is that all? No, it is not all. These graphs are not just something you can write on a piece of paper. They are objects. These are objects which have a structure, which have a sort of a shape, which have a shape. And this was introduced, this notion was introduced again in the 19th century, as you can see, was very, very fruitful in terms of chemistry. It was, as I already said, a periodic table. It was the chemical formula. And it was the fact that <clears throat> these structures uh, have shapes. These molecules, these objects have shapes. In 1874, two chemists independently proposed that chemical objects have a shape. Van Toff in the Netherlands and Lebel in France independently proposed, and they were convinced to be right, they said that chemical objects have a shape and this was stereochemistry. Before I stop this very, very brief overview of science of development of chemistry, I also mentioned Pasteur. Pasteur, of course, he was the first who recognized what is called molecular chirality. That molecules can be either like a left hand, as you see here on the left, or a right hand, as you see here, down here on the right. These are molecules which have a chirality, which are not superimposable in their, which are, have a plane of symmetry here between the two. And they are not, they are not superimposable. So they are symmetric with respect to a plane. This is molecular chirality. Let me also add one thing, something else. What Pasteur also did, of course, is much more than that. He was also one of the proponents of vaccines. And in present times, we are all waiting for a vaccine. The first real experiments were made by Jenner in, the, in Britain, Great Britain. And Pasteur had used the vaccine to, um, uh, to also to vaccinate the child and then against the disease. So at that time, we can now say, OK, we have gone from atoms to the molecule. And out of that, molecular chemistry has built up. And molecular chemistry is built on the formation of complex assemblies of atoms linked by very strong connections called covalent bonds. And chemists have then built up molecular chemistry, which is a way to master the organization of molecular matter the organization of atoms to, to connect different atoms together in very complex forms. And we can look at two milestones which illustrate that. The first milestone is the production in the laboratory of urea by Friedrich Wöhler in Germany in 1828. Wöhler made urea from another chemical, which is called ammonium cyanate. This was, first of all, um, what chemists call a synthesis, a, a generation, a making of a molecule from another one, from another chemical entity. It had, however, at that, time, at that time, another very important signification. At that time, I was thinking that one could not produce a compound contained in a living organism without the help of a magic force, which was called the vital force. And otherwise, if you wanted to make anything contain a living organism, you had to use this magic vital force. However, Werner was make, made urea, which is contained in urine, that means in a living organism, from ammonium cyanate, which is not a part of living matter. So he had just destroyed the notion of um, vital force. This magic force did not exist. There's a continuity between non-living and living matter. 
Living matter is just another type of molecule, another type of chemical object. Now let's jump by 150 years or so to vitamin B12. Vitamin B12, we have it in our organism. It's a very important vitamin in our organism. And it has as an important characteristic that is a very complicated object. It's a very complicated object compared to urea. This was produced in the laboratory from its building blocks uh, by what is called total synthesis. Total synthesis is progressive buildup of the molecule by, com by organizing the atoms, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and so on, in space at the right position, at the right, in, in the right structure, the correct structure. And it was done by two groups. One was directed by Robert Burns Woodward at Harvard University in Boston, and the other one by Albert Eschenmoser by the, at ETH, the Polytechnical University in Zurich, in Switzerland. They were, of course, they, they had a large number of co-workers, and it took about 10 years with, let's say, 120, 100, and maybe 150 men years, men and women years, to get this thing done. And uh, it was done, and it was a large construction. It was sort of to say the Himalaya, the, 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 the top uh, achievement of chemical synthesis at that stage. But of course, it was not the end of it. And chem molecular chemistry continued to develop over the years and to, pick and to generate more complicated molecules, even much more complicated new drugs, new materials, discover new reactions, new procedures for processes for industry, and so on. So molecular chemistry is a very adult science with a strong development and which will continue so. And at that stage, of course, and it continues nowadays, of course, many people contribute to it in, in all universities, research groups, industries, companies, and so on. But we have time to ask another question we think one should. And this question is the following. I illustrate it by taking a biological example. The blue sphere here is a cancer cell. These two purple bodies are two killer cells. Killer cells are the people, are the cells in our body, which make the police, which try to find out which cells have turned bad, have turned bad, have been transformed into cancer cells. And they have the mission of this to find it and to destroy it. Killer cells should not make a mistake. If they destroy a healthy cell, or if they do not destroy a cancer cell, you have a big problem. So how do the killer cells know that the partner, the one here, the blue thing, is a cancer cell? I can give another example. Here is a cell, a white blood cell with blue dots. These blue dots, this is the HIV virus. And this HIV virus, when it hits a white blood cell, can infect it. How does a virus know that it has reached its goal? In these two cases I illustrated, these two these objects which come into contact must have information about what the partner is. So for the killer cells to recognize the cancer cell as something also to be destroyed and the HIV to be the goal, the HIV virus to be the goal and being able to infect the white blood cell. So what happens? These objects are made of molecules and these molecules, these are, these are large objects made of many, many molecules and delineated by a membrane. And when they attach to each, when they get into contact, there are molecules on the surface of the cancer cell and molecules on the surface of the killer cells, which recognize each other. They feel each other. They, there's information for the killer cells in the molecules, which are on the surface of the cancer cell. This means that there must be a chemistry which is dealing with what happens between molecules between the molecules at the surface of the cancer cell and molecules at the surface of the killer cells. And that means that beyond molecular chemistry, there must be another chemistry which 
does not concern what happens inside the, mo the molecule, the buildup of this molecule, but the way in which molecules interact with one another. And this is what I have called supramolecular chemistry, which is the way of trying to understand how the interactions between molecules lead to attachment and lead to associations. It is mastering the interactions between molecular entities, non-covalent bonds. And three main functions were studied. How do molecules recognize one another? How can they react? with one another, how can they carry one into through a, a barrier like a membrane? I come back to that, transport processes. But the basic one is of course, molecular recognition. How do molecules recognize themselves? This can be represented in very simple terms. Of course, it's quite a complex process, but it can be at the start represented in simple terms. Molecular recognition first involves interactions. They have to bind together. They have to feel these molecules, each other. If they don't interact, they ignore each other. But another feature, information must be present. You cannot recognize without having information about the object to be recognized. Therefore, this molecular recognition process is an information process. In its most simple terms, it can be considered to be a complementarity of uh, two uh, features, the geometry of the objects in contact and the way they interact, the interactional features. Now, a very simple representation of this has been given very early on in 1894, again, the 19th century by Emil Fischer, a German chemist who got the doctorate, his doctorate in Strasbourg in 1874. We were very proud of the fact that Emil Fischer got his doctorate in our university. He is the one who wrote in 1894, a very, very famous paper also, which is the basis, let's say, I could say almost the basis of biology and life. He said that for a molecule to act on the other one, they have to fit together like Schloss und Schlüssel, like a lock and a key. And this is represented graphically here. Very simple, simple representation. It is, of course, much more complicated than just fitting two objects. But the basis is really that. The, the gross picture is fitting together. But of course, we know that the fitting is not just geometrical fitting, it's interactional, it is functional fitting, and so on. But it is the basis. And when I give general public lectures, if you come away from my lecture, you go away from the lecture and just remember that biology is based on locks and keys fitting together. You have already learned a lot of things. Now, the basis of this, let's have a look at it, the most important application of this molecular recognition. This is simply and complex, and of course, simply is a way to present it. It is the molecular storage of information in the double helix of DNA. And the double helix of DNA, as you know, represents the genome of living organism, the genetic program of living organisms on our planet. This genetic information is extremely simple if you consider the complexity of the organism themselves. It is just made up of a long strand of rather simple chemical entities onto which are attached four letters to which chemists have given a name. This group, they call adenine, this group, guanine, this group, thymine, and this group, cytosine. For chemists, these are very simple molecules, but these are the four letters, A, G, T, C, which write the genome of living organisms. And it's the sequence of these letters which makes up that genome. So the result, what makes a difference between a tomato and an elephant, or between a dog and a human being, is the genome. 
the sequence of letters, which is the basis of characterization of a given organism. Before I continue, because this is storage of information, but I would like to come back to one letter. Let's look at adenine. Adenine <clears throat> is this here. Even for those who are not chemists, you can recognize that adenine is formed of five HCN. HCN, there's an NH, uh, of course, is a bit rearranged, but if you count, there are here five carbons and five nitrogens. So it's five HCN and also five here, the, the hydrogens. Um, so uh, HCN is a very small molecule. It is found in interstellar space. A combination of five of those gives adenine, which means that a simple combination of a very simple small molecule into a quite simple, more complex molecule adenine represents one letter of our genetic program. If you add some water, you can make guanine, another letter, and you can make cytosine and thymine by some other chemical transformation. So this is a prebiotic, before life existed, self-organization of molecular matter, forming the components of molecules of life. I don't want to go into the proteins. This is more complicated. Now, this is the construction, the buildup of this letter, of this uh, information pieces, these molecule, molecular letters. How do you read the information? The molecular reading, the reading of the information comes by pairing up the letters. Adenine can pair up with thymine or uracil, which is a slight modification, by two points of interaction represented by these dots. And guanine can pair up with cytosine by three points of interaction. So again, it's very simple. It's really, it cannot be simpler. It is a binary system where the reading is done by two connections, two interactions or three interactions. These interactions are supramolecular. They are interactions between molecules and they are this binary system which allows one molecule to read the other one by this association, this pairing. So it's two, three, two, three, two, three, which is a reading pattern like uh, in a computer, it is zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, which is the way in which you store information in sequences of zeros and ones. Here is sequences of twos and threes, two, three, two, three, two, three, 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 two, 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 three, that's all right, so on. So if we come back to what chemistry really is, and what we said now, in chemistry is an information science. It's an information science where this information is stored into the molecular structures and it is processed by the contacts between molecules, these recognition processes at the supramolecular level. That means that chemistry is the science of informed matter not just the science of how matter is built, how is the structure of molecules, but also the information contained in chemical objects. So let's, uh, for the, it's sort of an interesting old picture, which I found, which is quite, in fact, quite well known. There's an earlier representation of the double helix. As you can see here, that's the bottom of the picture where you have a double helix here, huh? here. And what is on top of it is this. This is an old picture. And in some respects, one can comment on it in a very, very interesting fashion. The double helix is a genome of human beings. How do you transmit the genome to your children? Through a man and a woman. You need a woman and a man to transmit the genome. So this is a sort of a very interesting picture where the double helix is the pillar on which then builds this transmission of the genetic information. Now, let me just say a little bit, and I'm often asked, how did we come to these kind of ideas? After returning from my postdoctoral work, when I worked with Robert Woodward on the total synthesis of vitamin B12, 
Uh, we did for a long time more molecular physics and using chemistry to study physical processes. But I was also very interested in trying to contribute in some way to understanding the most complex feature of uh, us as a living organism, which is the brain. Now, the brain in 1966, 67, uh, as a chemist, you could wonder, is there any process in the brain or in the neural system, in the neural system, which can be approached on chem in chemical terms in a not too complex fashion? So this neurochemistry, did it offer a possibility for a chemist to contribute? And there's a process which is very well known, which is perhaps a point of access, which is the propagation of the nerve influx. What is it? It is the exchange of sodium and potassium ions across the membrane of a nerve, of the axon of the nerve, and it's the propagation of this, this changes in sodium potassium, this um, transfers of sodium potassium between the nerve, through the nerve membrane, which makes the propagation of the hair of the action potential. Now, sodium potassium is the, is the clue here. And this is something a chemist understands very well. What is sodium potassium? So one could surmise that in these membranes of the neurons of the axon, these membranes here, they must be, there must be molecules able to make the difference between a sodium ion and a potassium ion. There must be selective binding and selective transport of sodium and potassium ions across the membrane. Sodium potassium, this is something chemists can handle. And so the basis of it was, how can one understand that? Now, sodium potassium are part of one column of the periodic table of lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium. This is one column of the table. In this, in this column, there are these two sodium and potassium. So it's a collection of five spherical objects, five atoms which when they lose a proton, uh, electron become five cations, five entities of increasing size and bearing one positive charge. So the question is, how can we distinguish between that? How can we selectively bind and transport these spherical cations? How can we therefore do perform molecular recognition? Chemistry has this power of setting, asking a question and testing it. The test here was to say, all right, we have a collection of spheres of different size. These are the keys. Let's make the locks for recognizing these objects. And this led to the, from this generation, the laboratory of Molecules, which we call cryptans, because they have a, it's a crypt, have a cavity inside, which you can chemically make larger or smaller, and which where you can adjust the central cavity to the size of, an, of a sphere to get in. The first one is selective, it fits well for lithium. This one fits well for sodium. And the third one on the right fits well for potassium. The cryptans are these molecules, and when the cavity is full, has picked up the substrate, and we call it the cryptates. Let me just indicate that this work was done by two collaborators in 67, 68, 69, and until 70, 72. Two collaborators, Dr. Bernard Dietrich and Dr. Jean-Pierre Sauvage, and Jean-Pierre Sauvage received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2016, just three, four, three years ago, for work in molecular machines. Now, let me also point out that chemists also like the aesthetics of their objects. 
This is just another representation of this cryptate, which is uh, organic molecule and inside the cavity is this metal cation. And a friend of mine, a chemist from Hungary at the University of Veszprém in Hungary, in uh, Central Europe, yes, made this sculpture where you have the cryptand surrounding the cryptate. It's a rather nice sculpture. I like it very much. He was a very inventive chemist who became a sculptor, and he, they did for he did he produced many other such sculptures. I show you three more, four more. And I want just to illustrate this one on the right. You see, this is called the scent of the rose. The scent of the rose is the dominant scent. Of course, roses, depending on what they are, on the type of rose, smell differently. But um, let me just tell you about this main component, which is called phenyl ethyl alcohol. And this is phenyl ethyl alcohol. Here is the phenyl ring, CH2, CH2, OH. So this is a very nice artistic way of giving a shape to phenyl ethyl alcohol. Just to show you that molecules have aesthetics too. So molecular recognition, as I said, this is very important. I try to illustrate that. And I just want to make clear that, of course, one can then make things more complicated. One can design receptor molecules for different keys, receptors for substrates, and then to obtain their supermolecular entities very selectively. So there were very many studies have been conducted in numerous laboratories in everywhere around the world. Many also, of course, in Hong Kong, in mainland China, in Japan, in many other, many, most, many countries, in almost many, many laboratories. And this developed very well. So now uh, let me just come back then to where we are. In 1828, molecular chemistry was introduced by the work of, uh, uh, of Friedrich Böhler on the synthesis of uh, urea. This led then to the possibility of develop, developing molecular synthesis and generating molecules which can recognize others. And in, in 1978, I proposed the name of supramolecular chemistry for the chemistry which deals with the interaction between molecules, a receptor with a substrate, and these interactions leading to the formation of a supramolecule which have specific features, molecular recognition, transformation or reactivity, translocation or transport, giving functional supramolecular systems. So that's more or less the picture where then many studies were performed for trying to understand molecular recognition, trying to understand and control reactions and transport processes. At this stage, I want just to shift a little bit to also speaking about some applications. As you know, basic research is acquiring knowledge. And the applied research is then applying that knowledge. Of course, both are very important. And for somebody who acquires knowledge, it's always extremely, uh, ex extremely satisfying that this knowledge is applied. And for applied research, it is welcome to have new knowledge to apply. So the first characteristic of this application is that molecular recognition is the basic process by which drug discovery can be performed. Let me just very simple terms say that a drug is a molecular key for a biological lock. It is supposed to influence the biological lock either to inhibit some function or to amplify some function. So molecular recognition is the basis of drug discovery, of drug activity, of drug design. And we studied one, but I don't want to get into details. Then one can also make, of course, a variety of these objects. And here I just show you another one, which is uh, here a molecule, which is a different, it's still a crypt, sort of a crypt, but of different structure into which one has introduced an element of the periodic table called europium. And when these two are put together, uh, if you shine UV light on, on the external skin, 
it emits red light. This can then be used as a label for medical diagnostics for an immunoanalysis system, which was used to develop this um, apparatus, which was, is used in many ho hospitals for time medical diagnostics. The whole process was developed by Gérard Matisse at a, small, at a French company called SysBio. Now, I also mentioned very briefly, I just said that it can it exist in um, transport processes. Transport processes are these processes which make possible in the nervous system, the way I started with, this transport of sodium and potassium through a nerve membrane. Now, it also became important more recently as gene transfer. Indeed, gene transfer is a transport process where you want to introduce a piece of DNA, a gene, into a cell by helping it to cross the cell membrane, go to the nucleus, come to the RNA, then make the protein product of this gene. For that, one can use either process, processes using viruses. <clears throat> That's not our game. But also, synthetic vectors can be designed to envelope to go around to uh, envelope the DNA and then help it to cross the membrane. And this is, of course, the development of important agents, artificial agents, for gene transfer. These gene transfer agents are of importance for biotechnology and for gene therapy. For the moment, uh, one has used them, and uh, they are mostly, for the moment, objects of research, but these twin transfer agents are very important. I would also like to insist on one thing. They allow this, or let's say in general, gene transfer is a technology which is very powerful and we must use. It's a way to make genetically modified organisms. I like usually to insist on that. Nowadays, people are afraid of gene transfer. People say genetically modified organisms are dangerous. That is not true. We control very well how to do gene transfer. It, the gene transfer and making genetically modified organisms will help a lot mankind, for instance, in agriculture, to make plants which will resist drought, which will be able to grow in less in conditions where there is less water, or in conditions where it's much warmer than it is nowadays. So I think genetically modified organisms, you have to think about as a scientific advance, a very important scientific advance. Biomaterials are also another outcome of this um, uh, supramolecular chemistry, making supramolecular polymers, which can be biocompatible and biodegradable materials. I illustrate that in the following way. As you can see here, supermolecular materials uh, have been developed as biomaterials, biocompatible polymers, and um, they uh, were applied for making cardiovascular implants for correcting, for uh, reconstructing the heart of children having severe cardiac malformations. This is something which happened, you see, we introduced the concept of supramolecular polymers in 1990. In 2013, it took 23 years to be applied because indeed between a basic research process, which opens the field until applications can be done and especially applications for introduction into human being, it takes a long time because of all the developments which have to be done in the, uh, between one and the other. And it was done. And here is the first little girl who was implanted in, on the October 23rd, 2013. Dominica, she was operated on by Professor Leo Bukiaya, who is a cardiovascular surgeon at the center, pediatric center, Bakulev Pediatric Center for Cardiovascular Surgery in Moscow. 
And you see they are both, this is three months after implantation and they are both very happy. She is happy and he is happy. It worked and she's still in good shape. This is now, um, this was in 2013. So it's seven years later. Now a lot of children have been treated and uh, the same company has also developed now heart implants, pulmonary wire, heart valves, which have been uh, tested in Budapest, in Krakow, in Kuala Lumpur. Supermedicular polymers are also materials which have a property of being self-healing. Let me just illustrate that without going into details. By this very nice film, transparent film you can see, it's almost ideal in terms of transparency and lack of deformation. You, you cut it in two pieces, you superimpose the two pieces here, you press with your finger for a few minutes and you can stretch and it sticks. In other words, the cutting has been healed and the film is again a continuous film, a film which can be considered as having healed. Now let me go back to the main theme just for a short time. Uh, when you understand better how molecular recognition operates, you can try to use this to set up interlaboratory systems undergoing self-organization, which means that you want to use uh, molecular recognition patterns, the way in which entities recognize, to generate supramolecular complex architectures in a spontaneous way, but in a controlled fashion. An example of that is the buildup of a virus. And I here take the simplest one, the tobacco mosaic virus. It's a simple virus. It is composed of 2,130 bricks, which are protein subunits, which are represented, you can say, more and more complex, the piece of cake here, or this unit here, or this unit even more detailed. And these pieces can go together spontaneously and build up due to their shape and the way in which the pieces interact with one another to build up the tower, helical tower, into which fits the RNA, the genome of the virus. Now, this process is a spontaneous one. It happens spontaneously when these objects are in presence and it generates automatically by self-organization the tobacco mosaic virus. It looks like magic. It is not much magic, it is basic chemical processes involving structural chemistry, involving organic chemistry, biophysical chemistry, physical chemistry, and so on. So it is no magic. It's a basic operation, a basic process, which is just due to the fact that the, the subunits, the pieces, have the right shape and the right interactions. And this looks like a sort of a program chemical system, which into which you introduce a molecular program, the information is stored in the components, and the supramolecular operation processes the, the interaction pattern via the spe specific pattern, which may be called, which may be considered as a sort of a recognition algorithm. So can one do that in the laboratory, of course, uh, came with such processes are the basis of living organisms. I have shown the very simplest one of a virus, which is not even living, because uh, as you may know, even uh, including COVID-19, this is just a bunch of molecules. It's a stupid bunch of molecules, which doesn't live. It's just molecules which have given recognition processes, and it's these recognition processes which make, gives them their properties. Now, if we can want to see if we can do similar things in the laboratory and build up self-organization procedures, let me just give you an exam examples coming from one area, which is to use bricks, components, which are able to bind metal ions and connections, which are the metal ions in question. In other words, you have bricks made up, molecular bricks, and they are brought together by interaction, by sort of a glue, which is metal cations. Many of them have been made. I showed you some examples from our work. I have shown you the double helix of DNA. One can make artificial double helices, which have absolutely nothing to do with DNA, except that they are double helix or they're helical. Here on the right-hand side, you see a double helix. 
which is organized from two different from two molecules. They are colored artificially, of course, into uh, two different uh, colors. And they, you don't see here the metal ions they are hidden behind the molecules. Here is a bit easier to see. That's a triple helix, three strands wrapping helically around each other and held together here, here these yellow points by three metal ions uh, and giving them a helical shape. So that's again, a spontaneous formation on the basis of the way the ligands, the strands are built and the middle line which brings them together. That's an example of what you may call a nano cylinder, a nano container, where three linear molecules in red, four flat molecules in blue and 12 connectors, which link everything together. And they build up also spontaneously from 19 components, which go together to generate this specific nano container with three cavities, three linear molecules, four planar, 12 connectors, all together, 19 components, which go together to generate this nano cylinder. There are some others just to show you that, okay, there are interesting things to be done. Uh, there are nice molecules of all types. Uh, and these are now rather simple ones compared to what is achieved now in uh, various in the people working in these areas where they can make more and more complex molecules for more and more complex uh, procedures and uh, features to uh, functions. So this is also of interest to sort of expand on it for nanoscience and nanotechnology. Indeed, as you know, for the moment, we make uh, devices, computing devices, computers and other information uh, processing devices by fabricating the device and then, then manipulating them, putting them into the right organization. Now, if self-organization can be used, it would mean that one would like to generate supramolecular architectures, these complicated assemblies spontaneously by the possibility to organize the objects through recognition between the building blocks. This would be a self-fabrication rather than having to make the object, to make the device, it is to let it make itself and of course, that may be considered as an ultimate form of fabrication. It would mean being able to design components which simply by interacting with one another can lead to the organized device. In the future, that can be uh, maybe not an alternative, but an important complement to the present procedures. Now, just one word about what is going on right now and what we are working on. I have insisted up to now by chemistry by design, where you try to implement information, programmation to store information into molecules and let it perform its job. And this leads then to, as we just saw, control generation of molecular and supermolecular entities controlled, spontaneous, but controlled. Now, one step further into complexity is to let the system choose what it needs. In other words, it's selection. Let the chemical system choose the pieces it needs to build itself up. And um, this, is, uh, this involves diversity. We need different building blocks to do that. And dynamics, you need, the, you need a way in which these can exchange, feed each other, dissociate, associate, and so on. And this then leads to chemistry, which is now a new type of chemistry. Not so new, it's already 10, 12, 12 15 years old, but it is quite recent compared to supermolecular chemistry, which is now 50 years old. And it is a chemistry which bears on the possibility for a chemical object to change its constitution by dissociating into its components and reassociating into a new structure, or it may be the same structure or another structure. And this then makes possible a change in structure on reconstitution 
if the conditions have changed and adaptation to a change in constitution that is adaptive chemistry. In other words, if I summarize, the chemical object is made dynamic in its constitution. It can fall apart and recombine. In, and this can be happen differently if the conditions have changed. So the system may respond to external agents and therefore adapt to these changes and this is a way to develop what we call adaptive chemistry. So this adaptive chemistry is then a case of interest. Let me just very simply uh, sort of summarize this adaptation through variation in constitution uh, can lead to new ways, new procedures for searching for biologically active substances. This has been done for dynamic nanostructures, for nanoscience and nanotechnology and also dynamic materials, which can lead then to properties which static materials do not possess. So far, I, let me just uh, come to uh, a sort of a summary before I go to some more general considerations. Molecular chemistry is the basis, which are the bricks of matter, the elements are the bricks of matter, and this next step is the molecules, which are the combination of elements. Then the mo molecules themselves can combine into supramolecular chemistry. They can get organized, then dynamic, then adaptive, and of course, beyond that, maybe evolutive and so on. But these are steps in which chemistry has evolved and becomes more and more complex towards living matter and, of course, in eventually, ultimately, towards thinking matter. Let me now have, uh, just finish with some general considerations. As you may have known, I have, have, may have seen, I didn't speak so much about, I spoke a lot about using terms like living, thinking, and so on, but I didn't give many examples of it. I could, showed you many examples of objects, chemical objects, which were not biological ones, which means that in fact, the chemistry is not just to discover what already exists, like the components of living organisms, but also to create objects, chemical entities, which do not yet exist. That means that we have to write the book of chemistry, not just to read it. It means that we have to compose the score of chemistry, not just to play it. It indicates that chemistry has a creative power like art and that is why I like also to illustrate it by another sculpture of Auguste Rodin. The hand of the artist expresses out of a stone a sculpture here which is not contained in the stone. It's the hand of the artist which does it, which brings it out, which shapes the stone and that's the way in which chemistry in particular and science, science in general shapes matter. Chemistry can be considered as the art of matter. It is making out of elements all these objects, creating all these objects, which are not yet known, have not yet been created. This type of uh, consideration is already, can already be sort of deduced, can also already be found in uh, here 500 years ago. Uh, a little, one more year again, um, it was, uh, it was, uh, last year was a 500th anniversary of the death of Leonardo da Vinci. You know um, Leonardo da Vinci, I suppose, probably all of you. He's an artist, you know, Jogen, Gioconda. He is a uh, scientist and he's an engineer. So this person has written a sentence which is very, very strong. Where nature finishes to produce its own species, we are part of that, man begins using natural things. These are the elements of the of matter, the periodic table, if you wish, in harmony with his very nature. These are the basic laws which regulate the way in which these natural things can form. But the ending is very strong, especially for somebody 
who combines being an artist and a scientist and an engineer to create an infinity of species, meaning to create, to make all these entities which are an infinite number, which do not yet exist and which we can make. Of course, there are many, many, many which exist and which we have to learn about, but there are also many, many which we can make, like a painting, like a piece of music. There are many, many, many you can paint with the same colors, many, many, many you, um, pieces of music you can write with the same notes. Now, uh, going back to this, uh, I hope this uh, Chinese here, this was done by one of my collaborators, I hope it's correct. In the same country of Greece, there was Prometheus who stole the fire of knowledge from the gods. And he tried to, he wanted to bring it to mankind and here he's running away, looking over his shoulder to see if the other gods are not trying to catch him. They were not able to catch him. And here he is, Prometheus, holding in his hand the fire of knowledge given to mankind. One major consideration is we acquire knowledge, but we cannot give it back. The knowledge we have is there to stay. You cannot erase it and we have to live with it. Knowledge is understanding what is around us, what we are, what we will be probably, but this we cannot erase. What you know, you know. So our path of us as human beings on our planet, but I say, I say again, there may be another planet, others, other entities working along similar lines, our path leads us from the quest of knowledge, looking for knowledge to control of our destiny. This gives us this knowledge, the possibility that we control our own destiny. For the audience, there are many of you who will someday hopefully become scientists. Science is an uh, is an activity where you have to be bold, to look out, to look for new things, new understanding, new knowledge. And as this Chinese poet said, if you sit at the bottom of a well to contemplate the sky, you will find it small. You have to stick your head out and look at how big, how bright, how wide the sky is. In the past, information transfer appeared, uh, went through one entity, one species, like here, an ape and a human being. Presently, information transfer can occur through human beings. In the future, maybe that's the way to shake hands and to transfer information, recognition and all that. I don't mean by this that we will shake hands with only robots. There may be some, why not? After all, I mean, if it's just a machine, and we can shake hands with it if it is designed for that. However, it, what I mean, what I want to show by this is that we will no doubt transform ourselves. In fact, we have already transformed ourselves. For instance, we may have new teeth, which are not our natural initial teeth. We may have in our eye a new lens to, re to replace the natural one, which didn't work anymore, which had become opaque. Furthermore, I can even push this a bit further, if I get a heart transplant from another person. I cannot tell my wife, I give you my heart. 
It is not my heart anymore. It's the heart from another person. And in the future will probably be a heart which has been engineered by understanding the mechanisms of development from stem cells. So what I mean is that understanding living organisms, we will be able to do so. We will be able to use this understanding to change ourselves. The question is how, what do we want to do? Let me finish by citing a mathematician. I have not said a lot about mathematics. Here is a very famous mathematician, David Hilbert, who is buried in this small university city in Germany, Göttingen. And he has on his tombstone, he wanted to have written two sentences, one here and one here. One here, one here, these two sentences. What do they say? Very interesting. The top, we are müssen wissen, we must know. This is already a very strong statement. Huh? That's a statement for us scientists. We must know. We don't want to, to, go, to walk around not knowing, not being able to understand. We must know. But the second part is even much stronger. It's a sort of a vote of confidence. Wir werden wissen, we will know. It's a vote of confidence that we must know, yes, and we will know. Now, how far it will go and so on, the future will tell us. But here is what drives scientists. Scientists are driven by the fact that we must know and then we will know thanks to science. I understand that many in the audience are high school students. You are at the beginning of your life. You have to be very conscious of the fact that mankind needs more science. Mankind needs to be scientifically more educated. Mankind needs to spend time on trying to understand science, not necessarily knowledge details, there are the people, the scientists who do the science, but the general mankind, the general people in the general public have to know something about science. And as I often say, people are ready to spend hours a week to learn tennis, playing tennis, for instance. Why don't they spend a few hours learning science? Okay, why not play tennis? But more important would be to learn some science. So I say to you, young people, shine, science shapes the future of humanity. Participate. We hope you will participate because through science, you will shape, you will shape also using science, the future of humanity. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure to be with you.